Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So way back in 2001, Audrey and I had an experience with abundance. Even though on the surface it didn't seem that way at the time. We were both students. I was in my first year at Luther Seminary, and Audrey was graduating from Concordia University with her bachelor's degree, and our families wanted to be there to celebrate. Audrey and I had been nomads for those first few years of married life, and we were going to be nomads for a few years more, never really living in one place for more than a year, and many times just for a few months. But our little apartment in St. Paul was home for the moment, and we wanted to welcome our families and celebrate Audrey's accomplishments. But you know, our apartment was really small. The kitchen was so small that when you open the oven or refrigerator door, they would hit the cabinets on the other side of the kitchen. Our living room was maybe 10 feet one direction and 15 feet the other. How are we going to fit 22 people in there? We didn't even have enough chairs. And how are we going to cook for them in that small little kitchen all weekend? But we borrowed some folding chairs from our friends and we, we decided to try and make it work. Well, the night before graduation, I grabbed the frozen turkey breast out of the freezer and got ready to put it in the crock pot right before midnight so it would be ready by lunchtime the next day. And the, and the turkey breast didn't quite fit in the crock pot. It was really close to fitting, though. So I just kind of put some leverage on it, tried to do a little persuasion. And suddenly, pop, the crock pot broke into three pieces. Uh, sweetie, I think we have a problem. <laughs> and before we knew it, we found ourselves in a 24-hour Walmart at 11.30 at night buying another crock pot. Who did we think we were that we could host this kind of weekend, this kind of celebration? A Cracker Jack-sized apartment, no experience in hosting a group of 10, much less 22, but we did it anyway. And it was one of the most amazing parties, one of the most amazing weekends I can ever remember a chance to celebrate Audrey's accomplishment of graduating from college in four years, even though she'd attended three different schools in three different states, a chance to host our whole family, including Audrey's dad and her grandparents too, all of whom have since died. I'll never forget that weekend and the rich treasure of abundance that was ours even if just for a fleeting moment, because we were willing to offer our meager gifts, our meager space, and host a simple weekend of food and fellowship. Today we hear a story from Matthew's Gospel of unbelievable, an impossible feast as well. Listen as I read those words from Matthew 14, beginning with verse 13. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. And he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the crowds and all ate and were filled and they took up 
what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. What are we going to do, Jesus? I can just hear the panic in the disciples' voices. Before them was a crowd of 5,000 men plus women and children. They'd gathered when they heard Jesus was around, and Matthew tells us Jesus had been curing their sick all afternoon. Now it was evening, and the disciples reasoned that the crowd would be getting hungry, and they didn't want to try to figure out how to feed such a crowd. Jesus, they said, send them away so they can go into town and get their own food. Oh, that's, that's okay, said Jesus. They don't need to go away. You feed them. Us? <laughs> we don't have any food. Right? Well, I mean, we've got five loaves, two fish. But that won't feed the crowd. <laughs> Bring them here, says Jesus. And he blessed the food, he gave it to the disciples and told them to get to work passing it out already. And they did. Each of the 12 disciples offering food to over 500 men, women, and children. Here, take what you need. And all ate and were filled. Now, no doubt, it was a lot of work passing out all that food and cleaning up after the crowds. No doubt, it took a lot of trust on their part to give up their own supper and offer it to a hungry crowd. But they did, and all ate and were filled. And not only that, writes Matthew, there was food to spare. And the disciples who began the evening convinced that there was nothing to eat found themselves humbled at how God can use willing and generous givers to feed and care for far more than they would have ever imagined. Even in the wilderness, under conditions anyone else would describe as conditions of scarcity. It's a story that teaches us two very important things. First, it reminds me again of the generous nature of God. This story of the feeding of the 5,000 is a story of God's incredible abundance and generosity. But it's not the first time we've heard of God's extravagance through Jesus Christ. It was just a few weeks ago when we heard Jesus compare God with a farmer who extravagantly sows way too much seed and on less than ideal soil besides. Most of the seed was wasted, or so it seems, on the wrong kind of soil, right? But when you are sowing good seed in difficult places, sometimes you have to overdo it. Or in a different gospel, John chapter 2, we hear about the wedding at Cana. The wine runs out at this wedding party, and then Jesus turns water into wine, and not just a few bottles worth either, By John's estimate, about 180 gallons of the best tasting wine they'd ever had. 180 gallons? What extravagance. Or in Luke's Gospel, when Jesus tells the story of the father of this wayward prodigal son, this father didn't just welcome his son back, he welcomed him back with a huge, expensive, extravagant party. Or when Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan, This foreigner who doesn't just stop to help the wounded man get up, but takes him to the hospital, tells the caregivers, here is all that I have, my checkbook, my credit card, my cash, everything. I'll be back in a week, and if this isn't enough to cover his care, I'll give you more. For a man he didn't even know, not even one of his own countrymen. Extravagance. In all these stories, Jesus tells us what God is like. He rejoices when a lost sinner is found. He celebrates when life is given to those who are dying. He gives an abundance where something far less would do. When God created the world, he could have gotten by with like three kinds of flowers and and two kinds of birds, a couple animals here and there. That would have been good enough. Hmm? But instead, God makes millions of different flowers, thousands of different birds and animals, 
and dozens of varieties of people too. One race, but dozens of varieties, a spectrum of skin colors and languages and sizes and shapes. This isn't a God who's into just good enough, right? He overdoes almost everything, including salvation. When God saw us humans writhing in our own sin and pain and suffering, he could have sent his prophets and just been sympathetic from, a, from afar, you know, just brought a word of, hang in there, I hope it gets better, maybe someday it will, right? Uh, but instead, this extravagant God took on human flesh himself, sinking all the way into the depth of our lives, into our anguish and pain and bearing that pain himself. In the person of Jesus Christ, God bore human suffering and sin on his own shoulders. It wasn't enough to comfort us in our grief. He gave us the extravagant gift of his own life in order that he might overcome suffering and death, give us eternal life with him at no cost to us. A few years of paradise would have been enough, but he gives us eternity. Come and see God's extravagance. Come and see his graciousness. Come and see his love. You who are hungry or tired or thirsty or poor, come to this extravagant God and receive the gift of life. There is enough for all. This is just how God is. This story of Jesus feeding 5,000 people reminds me that this God of ours is never content with good enough. He gives an abundance of gifts each and every day and most of all gives us the gift of eternal life in Jesus Christ. But this story reminds us of something else too. It reminds me of God's call that we might give generously in his name too. Even in times of scarcity. He says to the, to the disciples, you give them something to eat. And when they finally offered all that they had, five loaves and two fish, he used their generosity to feed the crowd. And we too have been blessed abundantly. It might not always seem that we have been, but we have been blessed Gifts like our skills and our talents and our time and our treasure, our ability, our love. And though we think what we have is meager, we are called to give all that we have in the same extravagant way that God has given to us. God gives extravagantly to his creation and he often uses us as vehicles for that generosity. We give extravagantly to our, our friends with love and time and energy. We, we love our spouses in word and deed. We love our children and our grandchildren with all we have, our parents and our grandparents too. We don't hold back anything in our homes. We give our time and our treasure and our talents extravagantly. You take care of them, God says to us. And we respond, me? Me? I don't, even, I don't even know what I'm doing, right? All, all I can do is change diapers and, and read a few stories and try to teach my kids right from wrong. All, all I can be is kind and respectful to my mom and dad or my brothers and sisters or my grandparents or talk to them on the phone every once in a while, listen to their cares and concerns and worries. And All I can do is, but God gets a hold of our basic work of service and our families and multiplies it again and again. We give extravagantly in our places of work. We're called to pour ourselves into our work while we're on the job. We work honestly, as efficiently as possible, faithfully, not withholding our talents or time or effort, but giving all we have to our employers during the time allotted for such work. But God, we protest. My job isn't even all that important. In fact, it's, it's kind of boring most days. I don't even do that much. And then God gets a hold of our daily work and uses it to make the world a more reliable and trustworthy place. We give ourselves to our neighbors, helping them in any way we can. But, but God, all I can do is shovel a little snow or 
bake a few cookies or say hello now and again. All I can do is wear a mask when I go to the store. It's, it's not much at all. And then we look around at a world in need of racial justice and equality. We see a system so terribly broken and torn and we say, what could I possibly do that would make any sort of difference? All I have is ears to listen and a heart hungry for change. All I have is a meager voice to speak words of love to my brothers and sisters and to cry out humbly for change. But God multiplies that work too. And in our congregations as well. Could God really make a difference through a a willingness on our part to limit our attendance to in-person worship gatherings? To be part of of a house church, even if it makes you uncomfortable? To embrace worship life so different than what we've become used to? I've got nothing to offer. And it won't make a difference anyway, we say to God. But God calls us to be faithful. God calls us to invite, to witness, to give generously of our time and treasure, and God multiplies that effort to stir up faith in people around our communities and around the globe through our collective efforts as people of faith. The rest of the world panics in the face of scarcity, but not us, not we who follow Christ. That's where That's where we shine. We simply give all that we have and trust God to multiply it, and he does. When we give all that we have, when every moment we live is lived in service to God and his creation, God multiplies that effort to feed and care for his creation. Praise be to God Almighty and his Son, Jesus Christ for his abundant giving through creation, through daily bread, and through the gift of that same Jesus Christ. And thanks be to God for that call to live as generous givers ourselves. May God strengthen us to give all that we have every day. And may he multiply our meager efforts for the benefit of all. In Jesus' name, amen.